Uh, well, hey everyone, uh, thank you for being here. As Luke said, my name is Everett Muzzy. I am a researcher and a product marketer at Consensus. I'm Mally Anderson and I'm a writer at Consensus. Um, first of all, thanks to Shinju and Dystopia Labs for putting this meetup together. Make sure you follow them on Twitter at Dystopia Labs. Um, and also a huge thanks to Luke Youngblood and to Coinbase for hosting us and providing this gorgeous spread of food and drinks. Um, so we presented a version of this talk at DevCon in Japan last month, and Shinju saw the talk in Osaka and asked us to present it here. Um, we've been able to add a little more detail since then, but we're still working on... Okay, I'll be louder. We're still working on integrating a lot of feedback we got at DevCon, um, and there's still a lot more data we want to explore in greater detail before we publish this talk, so just be aware of that as we go through. Thank you for that festive beginning. Uh, <laughs> so over the last several months, we've been trying to figure out ways to measure and define the decentralization of the Ethereum network. Generally, the most popular comparative metric between protocols is throughput. Um, most of us know that the more decentralized and secure a blockchain is, the lower the throughput, at least at this stage in the evolution of the technology. So transactions per second are not a very effective comparative measurement. We set out to propose and explore a new measurement called decentralized transactions per second, or DTPS, as an alternative to throughput. Um, as we tried to measure existing protocols, transactions per second, and the extent of their decentralization, we realized that comparing most metrics across protocol is like comparing apples and oranges. Um, the entire blockchain ecosystem is still very young. It takes time to build these networks and to scale a protocol, and we're nowhere near the optimal level of practically any metric on any blockchain in 2019. So. We amended or perhaps scaled down our search. Uh, instead of asking which protocol can prove itself right now to be the most decentralized, we wanted to ask what does the evolution of decentralization look like across different protocols over time to indicate which one will be the most decentralized in the future. So we started by focusing on Ethereum because that's what we work on at Consensus and we know where to find all of the data we need to do that. So we started off by asking the questions, you know, what do we actually talk about when we talk about decentralization? And how can we objectively measure its extent uh, and monitor its evolution over time? And then what data can we measure objectively and what needs to be considered more su um, subjectively? So obviously de decentralization, decentralization is not binary, um, but it's rather a very complex and emergent process and it's going to evolve um, as the network grows. So we also need to identify metrics that we could track over time. So we started off by asking the questions, uh, these five questions, is Ethereum actually getting more decentralized over time? Are there metrics that show the network growing more centralized? Does the data reveal areas we should focus on addressing in the future? Um, can we make any meaningful predictions about the future based on what's happening now or what's happened in the past? And which of these metrics, if any, can we actually compare across protocols and across architectures? So we began our search of measuring Ethereum's decentralization over time by determining which aspects of Ethereum's architecture and usage, both on-chain and off-chain, um, most significantly impact its decentralization. So at this point in the research, we identified 19 key subsystems spread across four categories, um, and we are attempting to anchor as much of our conclusions in on-chain data as possible. Uh, so it's important to note, of course, that there are data points that we have not covered that we do consider important, but they're not necessarily on-chain or they're not clearly quantifiable at this point. Uh, two of those metrics in particular that we think are important would be the strength and distribution of power grids um, on which some of these nodes run, and then also the le legal jurisdictions and the relative stability of countries that are hosting different nodes. So those are two that we would consider in the future diving into. We just haven't had um, the opportunity to grab that data right now. We also want to note that there are other people writing about how to measure decentralization and how to define what's basically a pretty vague concept of decentralization. Um, and we've tried to situate our approach and our conclusions within that discussion. Um, law professor Angela Walsh criticizes the blockchain ecosystem's overuse of the word decentralization without having a concrete or broadly agreed upon definition. She argues that the vagueness of that term is starting to bleed into counterproductive legal and regulatory decisions. 
When it comes to defining and measuring decentralization, she warns against a phenomenon called Gresham's Law of Measurement, which states, quote, easy to calculate quantitative metrics tend to crowd out more relevant but difficult to measure assessments. She goes further to state that succumbing to Gresham's Law of Measurement means that allowing measurability to trump meaningfulness in other words, easily calculated quantitative metrics may provide the illusion of measurability while in actuality not being meaningful. And we acknowledge that some of the metrics we're discussing, for instance, the regular token holding percentage among whales might not be considered the most important or revelatory measure of decentralization. Where we find the real power concentrations in blockchain networks are likely in less defined areas like the relationship and power dynamics between core devs and prominent miners. <coughs> but a relationship is difficult to quantify and we still believe there's utility in starting from the ground up and quantifying as much as we possibly can so that we have some objective starting points from which to approach more difficult and nuanced studies in the future. So for the data that we're going to go through tonight, for as many of these data points, uh, we track their evolution quarter over quarter as far back as possible. Uh, many of those from the earliest days of Ethereum through the gradual adoption, a lot of the rampant speculation, uh, the hacks, CryptoKitties, the bubble, and then, um, of course, the course correction that we've seen in the past year or so. And much of the data in this talk was provided by Alethia. You might see that name around, um, and that is a data an analytics company focused on providing transparency into on-chain um, data on Ethereum. And we're going to talk about those four categories that were in that chart earlier. We're going to go through a few of those um, for each of those areas. Can you all see these numbers-ish? Are they too small? OK. Well, we don't really have a solution besides yeah. moving closer. So. <laughs> I'm asking that question <laughs> if I can do something about it. Uh, I mean, we'll send these around after. Um, we'll give you a URL to look at them in more detail. But if you can roughly see the direction of the lines, hopefully that's good enough. Uh, we'll do our best. Yeah. So um, if anybody wants more clarity on it, raise your hand and I'll explain it. We'll explain it in more detail. So this graph is showing the growth of accounts on the Ethereum network. That's the blue line. Um, and then it's also showing the growth, um, uh, the number of active addresses quarter over quarter, which is the red line. We're defining active addresses in this chart as the number of distinct addresses that have transacted or made a contract call at least once in that quarter. And then, as you can see, that spike in Q3 2016 um, was due to the DDoS Shanghai attack at DEF CON 2 in China, um, which is pretty interesting. But as expected, we are seeing the blue line, which again is total um, addresses on the Ethereum network, increasing over time. We do see active addresses, however, more or less flattening after the bubble of um, Q4 2017 and, and early 2018. And so the story this graph tells could be that people are um, simply using the network less after the bubble, uh, as the number of active addresses has more or less stayed uh, flat the past few quarters, despite the growth in overall addresses on Ethereum. When we look at the number of transactions and contract calls over time, we see that the cumulative number of records quarter over quarter more or less aligns with the number of active addresses, including the recent uptick in Q2 of this year. What we think this could indicate, although we think it would require more research to confirm it, is that we see a consistent level of activity despite the growth in the overall number of addresses. In other words, the, people being, the number of people being active on the network stays pretty consistent and they're transacting a pretty consistent amount quarter over quarter. There are two ways we think we could look at this. The first is that we could argue that it points to Ethereum's continuing utility and the <laughs> resiliency of network participants committed to using Ethereum despite the fact that the price is fluctuating a lot. Second, we could argue that it indicates that there's a consistent point of centralization on the Ethereum network, uh, and most of the activity on the network relies on a pretty small group of users who just keep transacting over time. Um, we'll need to investigate how many of these active addresses are repeat versus one-off users in order to better understand what this data means for decentralization overall. And so we also wanted to look at the account growth compared to um, ETH holders on, on the network. So this graph is showing account growth, which is again a trend, and this one it's gray, uh, over time by total addresses. And then an addresses that hold what we defined as a meaningful non-zero amount of ETH. 
So we originally charted this with um, just flat zero ETH and then got some feedback at DEF CON that that might not be the best way to actually look at this graph. So um, what we did is we defined the threshold of a meaningful non-zero by the amount needed to carry out an average transaction um, through the transaction fee in 2019. So all the accounts holding a smaller balance um, than that are considered through this chart essentially a zero balance um, as it's unlikely for them to be able to cover the gas to execute um, you know, essentially one transaction. So what this graph reveals is a fairly steady linear increase in non-zero addresses, which is, again is the um, orange line. Um, quarter over quarter, with no major bumps, even despite pretty rampant um, price fluctuations over time. So we can't necessarily mean to say that this means there's been a steady increase in the number of um, unique individuals holding ETH, as addresses are not tied to identities at this point. But it is also not a totally off-base conclusion to, to um, at least argue that or, or put it out there. So if that's true, then that's good news for the decentralization of Ethereum, um, suggesting that we could expect a consistently growing number of ETH holders on the network over time, even in the, price, uh, even in the face of pretty rampant price fluctuations. We could also suggest that the growing delta between the non-zero addresses and the total address count is increasingly made up by smart contract addresses. Uh, we think that evolution could indicate that the network is still being used as a means of direct peer-to-peer -peer transactions and DAP interactions, i.e. any interaction that require a um, positive ETH balance, but that the network is also increasingly being used for smart contract functionality. Overall, this would indicate that Ethereum is supporting more diverse and thus more decentralized types of on-chain business logic over time. Um, moving into growth in decentralized exchanges and DeFi. Um, decentralized finance or DeFi or open finance has been a major area of growth in the blockchain ecosystem over the last year. This graph shows the cumulative percentage of addresses on Ethereum that have transacted with a DeFi protocol, including a DEX, over time. For example, in Q2 of this year, all the addresses since 2015 that have interacted with a DeFi platform make up 0.69% of all the addresses on Ethereum that quarter, which is about 88 million addresses. Which is this one here on the right, on the far right, for those of you who can't yeah, see. Yeah, the most recent one. So this graph appears to show DeFi usage as a percentage decreasing over time, which might suggest that DeFi adoption isn't growing at the same rate as the number of new addresses on the network. But that conclusion doesn't add up given what we can observe about DeFi and about the ecosystem anecdotally. So we decided to look at the data in a different way. So when we took the same data set and we split it up to show um, DEX usage compared to other DeFi platform usage, uh, we saw a different story. So these two graphs show the change in decentralized exchange usage, which is the top one in red, and then non-DEX DeFi usage, which is an orange on the bottom. Um, so uh, specifically, again, as the previous one, the bars show the percentage of Ethereum addresses that have participated um, in, the, in that set of protocols uh, quarter over quarter. So There's 29 uh, things that go into that measurement, by the way. We didn't put them all on the screen because there are a lot, but we can send that around afterward. So if, you look, if we look just at the DEX chart, which is, again, the red one up top, we see a decline in DEX usage on the Ethereum network over the course of 2018 and, and into 2019, essentially following the, the, the price bubble and reduced transactions um, across the board. So that decrease in volume um, is all, you know, due not only to the decrease in transactions, but then also due to the increase um, in new addresses on Ethereum over that same time period. So then when we look at non-DEX DeFi growth, again, the, the bottom graph in orange, uh, we see that people's interaction with a growing diversity of DeFi applications is actually increasing dramatically. So these opposing trends of a decrease in DEX usage, but an increase in DeFi usage, um, sorry, uh, it, it definitely deserves more analysis, but it does suggest to us that early in the DeFi ecosystem, access to decentralized finance-related applications was largely restricted to DEXs. So overall, therefore, we could reasonably conclude that though DeFi usage as a whole has decreased per that previous graph, um, we, uh, that decrease is due specifically to a decrease in DEX usage um, and not to overall, um, or not to the newly emerging DeFi platforms. 
because we see that non-DEX DeFi usage has increased dramatically in that same time frame. So um, we're seeing essentially that the newest wave of DeFi has introduced a host of new protocols and that adoption is rising. So from a decentralization perspective, this means that the ecosystem is moving towards a greater number of active use cases, active dApps, and smart contracts. And essentially more options for people to execute decentralized finance means fewer central points of failure for the ecosystem. Um, moving on to tokens now, tokens and coins. Um, this graph shows ETH ownership of the top 10 addresses in pink, the top 100 in yellow, the top 1,000 in green, um, all as a percentage of the total ETH supply over time. So the rest of these supplies in gray. Um, we think the story this chart tells is fairly visible. The top 10 and top 100 addresses on the network are owning a steadily lower percentage of the total ETH over time. That could just be the passive result of increasing supply diluting the percentage owned by the top whales, but the trend still seems significant enough to overall ownership to show overall ownership decentralization. Um, interestingly, the top 1,000 addresses have had a recent increase in their percentage ownership of the total supply. Some of the larger accounts from the top 10 and top 100 have possibly been pushed down into lower tiers in the past few quarters, which could account for the recent uptick in the ownership of the top 1,000 accounts. Looking at the overall trend since 2015, we see that ETH ownership is becoming more dispersed overall across addresses. We can't necessarily assume that more addresses holding smaller amounts of ETH means that new like more new unique individuals are participating in the network or owning ETH, but we see that the number of non-zero addresses is increasing over time and the concentration of the top 10 and 100 is decreasing over time. Um, with the ecosystem being as young as it is, the unequal concentration of wealth this early on, we don't think is necessarily a major red flag for decentralization in the long term. Like we all know how the crowd sale happened and how the network has evolved um, in its first few years. But looking ahead, ETH concentration in the hands of a few becomes more of a concern when the network shifts to a proof of stake consensus algorithm starting sometime next year. In proof of stake, influence on the network is more closely correlated with ETH ownership. So as Ethereum 2.0 rolls out and as proof of stake replaces proof of work, it'll be important to watch out for staking power concentrating in the hands of a few owners. So then we wanted to look at token adoption alongside um, essentially ETH uh, usage over time. So the green line on this graph shows the total amount of circulating ETH, in other words, ETH moving between addresses quarter over quarter. It is essentially correlated to the price of ETH with that spike aligning with the um, price increase and then, and then the burst. Um, and the colored bars that move right to left show the volume of a few selected ERC-20 tokens circulating a quarter over quarter, and their value is measured in, um, in ETH. And so the tokens we measured here are the top 10 by market cap, and then we added a few additional ones that we were interested in looking at, um, including DAI, Loom, Matic, and, um, and a few others that we just wanted to check out. So the purpose of this graph was to see if activity on the network is getting more diverse from both the utility and a speculation perspective. What we believe it shows is that uh, despite a relatively stagnant ETH price, more or less recently, the ETH value in circulating tokens is increasing dramatically. Um, not only is the circulating value of tokens increasing, but also the diversity and market share of tokens um, is increasing too which suggests that users are now using more ERC-20 tokens and doing more with them across the board. We also wanted to point out the emergence of stable coins on this graph, um, and especially in the past few quarters. Stable coins offer little to no opportunity for um, speculation, which is why we think it supports our conclusion that the growth in both ETH value and the diversity of tokens in the past few quarters is due to people diversifying their activity on the network instead of just um, using the network for speculative purposes. 
So this means that people simply have more options. Um, that network ac activity isn't contained to just a few useful protocols and that the network is steadily decentralizing, um, at least in terms of token usage and token diversity. Um, so now moving along to the protocol section of our research. Um, this graph probably looks crazy uh, from far away, but um, basically what it shows is the growing concentration of mining pools over time as measured by um, the percentage of total block production in the top graph and the percentage of total addresses paid out per quarter in the bottom one. Um, in each one, colors respond to the same mining pool. So um, the green bars on the bottom of each graph are Ethermine, uh, F2 pool is in blue, Spark pool is in pink, Nano pool is in orange, um, Dwarf pool is in a grayish blue. Um, so the top graph shows the percentage of blocks for which each miner was responsible quarter over quarter. The largest producers, which we're most interested in for this data set, are the mining pools. In Q3 of this year, we see that Ethermine was responsible for 23.8% of the blocks mined, which is up from 8.84% in Q2 of 2016, which is the, um, the first quarter we're measuring on here. The bottom graph shows of the on-chain addresses that were paid mining rewards, um, what percentage of those payouts each mining pool was responsible for. It's worth noting that this data is only particularly insightful for mining pools that pay out their mining rewards um, directly to miners' on-chain addresses. Uh, mining pools that pay out through direct deposit or some other on-chain, or sorry, off-chain method um, can't be tracked with um, in this data pool. So with this data set, um, over time we're seeing that four pools have started to dominate the mining pool landscape. Um, Ethermine, F2 pool, Spark pool, and Nano pool, um, which are the green, light blue, red, and orange ones, um, collectively have edged out past competitors like Mining Pool Hub and Dwarf Pool over the past year or so. So today, those four main protocols account for over 72% of quarterly block production, and they pay out to over 83% of the miners across all the mining pools. So in particular, we're seeing a, um, a potentially concerning dominance in block production between Ethermine and Spark Pool, which today account for just under 50% of the blocks produced per quarter. Um, and together, Ethermine and Nanopool pay out to nearly 70% of the miners um, on chain. So, we started off you know, at DevCon saying that the concentration of influence among a few mining pools is definitely not ideal, but it's not necessarily a, a major concern. Miners are supposedly pool agnostic. They will migrate to whichever pool offers the best incentives. Um, if we assume rational behavior by miners, if a single pool were to reach a hash rate close to 50% or uh, visibly collude with other pools to mount a 51% attack, the miners would uh, theoretically abandon those pools to protect their income. So we wanted to see if we could actually test that assumption. Um, so we visualized miners' relationship to different pools through this chart. So we pulled data for payout transactions of all mining pools for the latest 24-hour period, um, which was November 3rd, so just a couple days ago. So each of the um, denser colored circles sort of around the edge is a um, mining pool, and then the sort of web of similar colored dots around it are the addresses that were paid out on-chain in mining rewards. Um, and the red dots in the center are the mining addresses that receive payouts from more than one uh, mining pool. So we can see that the overlap, essentially the number of red dots, is not that great. Um, there are not that many of them. Um, but it still indicates that there are miners just within this 24-hour period that for one reason or another did not remain, for lack of a better word, loyal to just one pool and instead receive payouts from multiple pools. So we obviously just very recently pulled this data um, specifically for this meetup. We tried to pull cumulative data quarter over quarter as we had done for previous graphs but our um, data scientist tool kept on crashing with the amount of data. So hopefully we'll find a way to pull that and show it quarter over quarter, but we think this could reveal some really interesting 
insights into uh, miner behavior on mining pools. So we're excited about um, continuing to work with Alethio and pulling the rest of this data. So for the time being, though, we're still running with the assumption that the concentration of influence among a few mining pools isn't ideal, but that miners can be assumed rational and pool agnostic, so it's not a deal breaker. However, now when we look at the number of mining pools and the number of miners over time, we see a very distinct and sharp decline in both, especially over the past year. Um, this graph shows the change in the number of miners um, in red, specifically on miner pools, alongside the number of mining pools, which is in orange. Um, and since the market bubble, we've seen both of them drop, and especially the number of miners um, has declined quite steadily. So in short, what this means is that we have fewer miners that are active on fewer mining pools, and fewer mining pools are responsible for network maintenance. Um, as a side note, we think it's important to re-emphasize that the number of miners on this graph isn't necessarily an exact number of the mining pool members out there. We identified the number of miners in mining pools based on on-chain payout addresses. Um, and again, some mining pools pay their miners off-chain off chain and we can't account for them. So the number could be higher if we were able to consider unaccounted miners on here. Um, on the other hand, since we tracked this data quarter over quarter, it's possible that we've also captured some duplication. Um, the miners represented by the red dots in the previous visualization um, would be considered as two miners on this graph. So this number could be lower if we're accounting for duplicates. Um, but overall, we think that mining pools are clearly an area of increasing centralization on the Ethereum network. Lower ETH price, reduced block rewards, and a fairly stagnant hash rate have meant that fewer miners, um, sorry, I lost my place here. Um, fewer miners are incentivized to join the network and laws of efficiency have concentrated the influence over the network into the hands of markedly fewer mining pools. Um, Again, the switch to proof of stake starting next year will redefine this area of trending centralization. Um, until then, we think it's important for the ecosystem to keep an eye on increasing concentration of mining pools to ensure that we don't trend too much um, toward a harmful imbalance of power. So the next section we were looking at is uh, node and, and node distribution and node count. And so we wanted to graph the geographical distribution and concentration of nodes that make up the network over time. And we expected that geographic diversity would uh, generally increase over time, even if the overall number of nodes had peaked when the price was uh, highest in, in early 2018. What we, quickly, what we quickly found out was that our first hurdle was actually finding this data. Uh, node data is notoriously difficult to gather. It is harder to validate. And as we discovered, it is nearly impossible to track historically. The data in this animation is from Node Tracker on Etherscan, um, and they were gracious enough to give us access to their historical data, which even for them only goes back to October 2018. Um, so this shows the node count by country only over the last year, and we weren't able to get any visibility into um, node distribution before that. So this animation is a heat map which means that the warmer colors are the highest node counts and the cooler colors are the lower node counts. In general, we see some consistently bare areas, uh, particularly in Africa and the Middle East. But of the countries that have maintained nodes over time, uh, we are seeing fairly uniform fluctuations rather than random sudden spikes or drops in particular jurisdictions. And despite the opportunity for greater distribution in some of those regions that we mentioned, uh, the data does demonstrate fairly impressive geographic decentralization across the world and um, also a variety of legal and political systems. So these graphs are looking at the node count versus the price of ETH and the size of a default node. Um, there's been a lot of fluctuation in the total count of full nodes running the Ethereum network uh, over the course of its life. Right now, for example, the number is about half of what it was around this time last year. On the surface, this probably looks a lot like centralization. There are fewer nodes overall and presumably fewer people running those nodes. There are a lot of reasons why this could be, but we looked at two factors to see if there was a correlation. 
Um, so the graph on the left shows the first assumption, which is maybe when the price of ETH is high, the number of nodes increases because miners can theoretically make more money by running a node. This graph demonstrates that that doesn't seem to be the case, at least over the course of the last year, which again is all the data we were able to get. When we look at the node count, which is um, in that grayish blue color versus the ETH price in green, it looks like there's actually a negative correlation. The node count was at one of its lowest points in June of 2019 when the price was highest and it was quite high during the price dip at the end of the summer. So even if that correlation was there historically, which a lot of people told us they thought it was, it doesn't seem to be true in today's ecosystem or over the last year. Um, the graph on the right shows our second assumption, which is that maybe as the average node data size increases over time, fewer people are incentivized to run a full node. Um, so we graphed the node count in blue against the total size of a default node on the geth client in red and the parity client in orange. About 97% of all Ethereum nodes are running one of those two clients. And about 95% of the nodes on the network are default nodes as opposed, as opposed to archive nodes, um, which have historical data and therefore a much higher data burden. Um, just quickly, you see a big dip in the red line, um, which is the geth node size in July of this year, which coincided with a version release that um, drastically decreased the database size. Um, so despite that spike, obviously the average node size is um, increasing over time as more blocks are mined and as more data is stored on the blockchain. It seems reasonable to assume that as that default node size gets bigger, it gets more expensive and takes more energy to keep a node running and to keep it synced, so perhaps fewer people are bothering to do so. Um, it looks like that's the case uh, based on what this graph is showing, or at least we see a clearer relationship between um, node size and node count than there is with the price of Ether. Um, as we move toward proof of stake next year and sharding the network, the node size burden won't be as much of an issue. So maybe this trend of node attrition won't continue into next year. Um, there are also a lot of interesting experiments happening around the ecosystem to find ways to make running a node cheaper and easier. So we're excited to keep tracking this data set through the changes of the coming year on the network. So when we first um, scoped out earlier this year, the value of sort of embarking on this attempt to measure decentralization and our approach to the research, our, our sort of our vision and our goal was to come up with a formula, for lack of a better word, that we could apply to um, any blockchain, regardless of its architecture. Uh, we are, after all, advocating against maximalist thinking. And so we knew that there was not a lot of use in focusing just on Ethereum when we were trying to create a, a comparative metric. The reality, of course, is that we both work on Ethereum and also the reality is much more complex. Uh, when we began comparing those 19 subsystems of decentralization across other protocols, we quickly realized that most of them don't translate across different network architectures. Um, Decentralization means different things depending on which consensus algorithm and the amount and diversity of activity on a given network. So like maximal decentralization for a proof of authority blockchain will look very different than it would for a proof of work blockchain or a proof of stake blockchain. Um, so the next step in our project is to identify as much of this objective data across protocols as possible in order to compare how decentralized they are um, against one another. So from the data and the analysis that we've done, what conclusions can we take away? The first is that the network is, appears to be most clearly decentralizing when it comes to the reduction in the holding power of the top 10 and 100 addresses. Um, as we head towards Ethereum 2.0 and proof of stake, uh, watching what happens with these ownership percentages will be um, pretty crucial. Um, second, the clearest area of centralization is in mining pools and the concentration of power in, in just a small handful of those pools. We also suspect that node attrition might be a large area of concentration, um, but again, we don't have enough historical data right now to, to really prove that concretely at this point. 
the third and you know fairly large point is that we're not trying to make um, a point that we're doing an especially good or bad job of decentralizing uh, Ethereum. And we're not even trying to make a value judgment about any of this or what teams are doing or, or what they're not doing. It seems obvious that activity on Ethereum is getting more diverse. Developer mind share is growing. Um, we're making steady progress on a lot of security initiatives and that the introduction of use cases like DeFi, open finance, um, have done a lot of really interesting things to the ecosystem that we haven't been able to um, cover here and they probably deserve their own study. Uh, you know, we think it's reasonable to argue that Ethereum is ahead of most other protocols in terms of measurable on-chain decentralization. Um, over the lifetime of the Ethereum network, we've seen much greater complexity and more layers of activity happening off-chain, um, especially in the last year, none of which we were able to measure here. Um, that's only going to get more true over time. So in some sense, all of these metrics are only going to get harder to track in the future. Um, but we also think the security and decentralization of Ethereum as a base settlement layer is that much more important to keep an eye on. Um, so we intend to keep watching and measuring uh, these metrics on mainnet. Um, this is our last point is that it's crucial to have accessible historical data about any network so that um, everyone involved can watch relevant metrics like these evolving over time. Um, in Ethereum, we're lucky to have robust tools like Alethio and like Etherscan, but the data even for Ethereum can be pretty hard to find, let alone make sense of um, in a very zoomed out and big picture sense. Um, and that's even truer for other, um, other blockchains. Uh, we want to say thanks again to Etherscan for giving us access to some of their non-public node tracker data historically, and to our colleagues at Alethio, especially Danny Sui and Momo Araki for helping us pull this data and create these visualizations. Um, and that pretty much wraps it up. We have a lot more data that we're still working through analyzing, um, some of which we're showing here, as well as gathering data from other protocols, as we mentioned earlier, that we want to do. And for those of you who can't see, and this is stuff that we haven't really been able to dive in and, and sort of look at the raw data yet, but there's average mining rewards per quarter on the top left. Um, there's some gas fee um, on the right. The bottom left is the number of function calls and the diversity of function calls over time. We think we can look at that and say sort of what are people actually doing on the network and, and what concentration. And then the one on the bottom right is the um, relationship of uh, DeFi and DEX protocols through the users, and the users are sort of the dots that are spread throughout. So we can actually get a snapshot of um, how diverse are people being within just you know, a snapshot of the DeFi uh, ecosystem. So um, hopefully we'll have some more analysis on those pretty soon. So we are working with Alethio to put together a portal so we can share all of this data um, and keep it updated over time. Ideally, it doesn't really stay stagnant sort of in the past. So a very early version of that dashboard is available. If you search for Lethio on Tableau, um, or if you take a picture or remember that kind of long URL. Um, we're working on making it a bit prettier, but right now you can see the, the charts that we talked about and, um, and look at them and sort of dive more into the individual numbers that are there if you are curious. Um, and if you're interested in using this data or um, discussing it further, giving us feedback, um, we would love that. Um, certainly let us know. A lot of this data will continue to evolve. We might have different ways of looking at it, um, probably some more zoomed in and defined ways of looking at it. And then for a lot of this data, there were qualifications that we didn't have time to go into. So um, if you are going to you know, reference it or, or talk about it, let us know because we can provide some more insight to where those numbers came from. Um, you can reach either of us at the emails on the bottom right of the screen if you want to stay in touch. Um, Shinju will send the video of this talk around in about a week to this whole meetup group, um, and we'll make sure she has the published paper version of this talk ready to go out with it. Um, thank you again to her and to Luke and Coinbase. Thank you all for coming. Thank you. It's 10 to 8, so we probably have time for a couple of questions if anyone wants to ask questions. Yep. Uh, do you have a zoomed in version of the function calls graph? Yeah, I can. We can probably pull it up.
Oh, um, someone asked if we have a zoomed in version of the function calls graph. Yeah. Um, do you want to like, do you want me to pull it up? So yeah. it's not. Um... Can we just plug in your computer? Um, I just mean I was going to like send it to you so you don't have to. Um... You can plug in my computer. I mean, again, this is it's hard to see on my computer, so it'll be hard to see up here. Um, but the sort of shrunken gray version of the graph. Oh, um, oh, there we go. Yeah, so the little version shows um, the top 20 function calls per month, including transfers. And then the big one is um, without transfers. Yeah. We knew that transfers would be the largest one, so we removed that to see sort of without transfers. What else are we seeing? And sort of on the Tableau dashboard, you can go in and see what the different functions are and then um, identify them and then sort of see how this, they've evolved over time. It like very roughly follows the price graph, but not quite. The peak um, is in November, December of 2017. Um, but yeah, there's just an absolute ton of data that went into this graph, so we haven't finished analyzing it yet, but it's on the Tableau if you want to go look at it in greater detail. Yeah. Question. So you guys mentioned about going to proof of stake mm -hmm. next year, and this discussion has been going on for a while, and for a saving. I'm an engineer myself in, you know, working on proof of stake protocol for a while. Uh, what I see is going from proof of work to proof of stake, it's like changing the car engine while you drive on the highway, right? <laughs> so what do you think chances are for Ethereum as a big, as it exists today to go to proof of stake versus maybe start a whole new chain, which is Ethereum proof of stake type of protocol? What is more likely to happen? Yeah. Well, at first, probably preface, we're not 2.0 experts. We are um, mostly listening to our colleagues who are 2.0 experts. Um, but at least from what we understand, there's the rollout of the beacon chain, which would be able to test that functionality. Um, from everything I've heard, no one has, no one's concerned about being able to smoothly transition over. There is um, discussion, the ETH 1.X, which is under discussion to be continued sort of parallel to um, the beacon chain, there is a talk about if that chain should just be continued um, forever, which to a degree might sort of be two co-operating chains. But I think that discussion probably will end in 1.x being ended once um, 2.0 is proven completely functional. Um, There's a team at Consensus called Quilt, which is working on um, like making sure the first two or three phases of the transition happen smoothly and that things can travel back and forth um, between the two versions. Uh, and they, um, you know, they're adding team members all the time. They were at the interop meetup in Canada over the summer and um, we have great faith in them to, to pull it off. Uh, so we'll see what happens. <laughs> Us too. We certainly have nothing to do with it personally. Yeah. You show slide with two columns, one of them technical and sort of technological decentralization, speaking about nodes and stuff, and another one uh, sort of governance slash like human decentralization. Isn't it like what is the state of art right now of a framework, how you can measure different uh, sort of metrics of a non technical decentralization project? What I mean by that, for example, in a uh, if you we all know that very few people might decide how the project will evolve. And as we learned from, for example, a uh, maker type project, uh, kind of this, uh, if you have a real business adoption, mm -hmm. this ideological, scientific resistant priorities might go lower in these two ways. So, how do you kind of like measure this part? Because it's like as, as important as technology. Um, yeah, so the question is about sort of the, like the closer you get to governance and human behavior, how are you quantifying it? Um, I, there's no really good answer to that. That sort of goes back to the first thing 
um, one of the first things that we talked about, which was this argument that just because it is quantifiable doesn't mean that it's meaningful. Um, and it's actually sort of the intersection of those metrics when you get to, okay, if you can identify the number of miners and you can identify the number of nodes, that might tell you something, but doesn't quite tell you as much as what's the relationship between those two. Um, and I mean, to be quite honest, you get into pretty, pretty muddy waters there and there's not a super clear answer. What we could try to do is look at um, past decisions, on-chain decisions like a fork and look at that governance and see if we can apply a measurement to it that would um, work if we were comparing it to any sort of decision that's made on, on a public blockchain. So that law professor um, Angela, Angela Walsh, Walsh argues that uh, the weak points of centralization can only be identified when a protocol goes through a crisis, which is really when we only see a um, sort of something come to head that requires pretty immediate governance. And so if there's a way that we can apply a, a, a number to those in the past, which almost every blockchain has had, or every blockchain that's been around for a bit has had, then we may get closer to sort of quantifying human behavior. But it's, it's pretty tricky. And at some point, you may just have to say, this is where the data ends. This is the most that we can quantify. And that's what we have to be happy with. I mean, this is also like, this is a very personal opinion, I'm not even speaking for Everett, but I actually think a lot more has been said and written about the sort of social and governance elements of decentralization than actually trying to like drill down into the data, which is partly why we decided to approach it this way, like very concrete on-chain data. Um, I mean, from Vitalik's influence on the network to um, like the structure of the core dev calls and meetings to controversial decisions like Prog pal, like it feels like there are a lot of people already talking and writing about that, but that, um, you know, it's just a piece of what decentralization of a big and complex network looks like. So, I mean, this is admittedly a pretty narrow slice, but we felt that not very many, many people had been trying to approach it in, in this concrete way. So, our scope is narrow, but we think more people need to be looking at the full spectrum of decentralization and what it means. Uh, have you looked at um, quantifying non-blockchain or non-technology decentralized systems such as governments or court systems or like regular corporations? Um, only, so the question is if we thought about um, quantifying so, sort of the, the like existing structures like law and, and governments. Only so much in that we talked about what would the value be of saying, okay, well, if we look at node distribution and we're seeing a concentration of nodes in, let's say, a handful of countries, how diverse are the, you know, the, the laws and the political structures of those countries? How tenuous are, are, are their regulations and how stable are, are, are their societies? We didn't get into actually quantifying them, but I think it's worth saying, you know, again, if we at one point start applying numbers towards human behavior, we should be able to do it towards human systems as well. Um, so we've only discussed it sort of as an abstract, something we'd like to do, but haven't been able to actually apply um, anything to it. I'm pretty sure the word decentralization is over 200 years old. And um, I mean, its usage over time has meant a lot of different things. And I do think it's sort of a buzzword that's tossed around kind of vaguely in, in blockchain and in like decentralized protocol architecture conversations, which um, again is why we tried to do this as like step 0 0.1 of what we hope is many more steps for everyone to kind of reach a consensus on what we're talking about with this stuff. But, um, but it's definitely interesting to consider it, not just in terms of blockchain protocols, but um, but many different kinds of um, network organizations and social organizations historically. Yeah. I just would like to add some time. Now, I came to respect Ethereum uh, for decentralization aspect. Right. And just as a sign of warning, when you are switching to a proof of stake, it's a big risk to take because of centralization risk. Uh, I was one of the original block producers from the US. Those block producers actually launched the US. And we were trying to build a digital democracy on blockchain. That was an original idea. That's what we were trying to do. But what we ended up with was basically a Chinese oligarchy. Because 
it's not a secret that the US is 80% centralized in China. And, uh, and it's just a, it's a concept of proof of state. Imagine if you lived in a society where your vote only goes as far as your bank account balance. If you only have 100 dollars in your bank account and your vote has a weight of 100 dollars, and if you have 100 million dollars, and your vote goes as far as 100 million dollars. That's the governments on the blockchain. And the, and the reality is that 80% of stake was in China, and they took a full advantage of that, right? They, I mean, I believe they showed themselves in the light because they owned all the resources in China, and it became a Chinese centralized chain. And so what project wants to deploy on a chain that is centralized and fully controlled in China, right? In the current political situation, nobody does. And like I, me, as being one of those original block producers who launched this chain, I can fully kind of dissolution with that concept. Mm. Yeah. That's why I see a risk, right? As born with a proof of stake, is that you might lose the decentralization nature that you have for Ethereum, and you might see all those powers that have the most stake can start to, you know, control and say, oh. Yeah. The the question was sort of about the um, the general risk associated with moving to proof of stake, which definitely are very real. Like in the sort of, you could argue that maybe it's going to be several steps forward and also a few steps back. And um, I mean, I think an advantage of where the price is right now is that hopefully like being a staker on Ethereum 2.0 will be a reasonably accessible benchmark for a lot of network participants to hit. It's not um, you know, the question of, um, of whales starts to reset a little bit. I also think there are people, um, you know, caring and working a lot on, um, educating people about staking and, and how things change in 2.0. Like Shinju was telling us right before, um, we came up here about her project to, uh, educate students about, um, staking and trying to get more people and more projects involved in, um, in the very different landscape of 2.0 when it takes shape um, over the next year. So, I mean, again, all we can do is try to make as many people aware as possible, but it's definitely true that, that it's not going to be simple or straightforward. And um, in some ways, you're just porting a new set of risks to a new network architecture. But I feel pretty strongly that <laughs> proof of stake is, uh, is more sustainable and scalable than proof of work. And, I assume you and many of our colleagues agree, uh, but yeah, agree. Thank you for sharing your experience. That was interesting. Um, okay, well, thanks Good. everyone again for coming. Uh, watch your email for a video next week and um, email us if you want to keep talking. Thank okay. you. Thank <laughs> you.